for inviting me here. So it's yeah, a great pleasure to be here in Seoul. I hope, um, yeah, so I hope the graduate students will you know, find some useful from all these lectures. So thank you. I guess, okay, today what I'd like to do is, first of all, start with a little bit of a bit of an overview of um, result, some results on hyperbolic structures on three manifolds. But then I want to concentrate on so methods for actually computing these hyperbolic structures. So how can we actually find them and work with them to study examples? Okay, so I guess I've put up a few references here, but um, I guess the prime reference, kind of the starting point for most of this theory, are these notes, lecture notes of Thurston from Princeton University. So that's kind of the prime source for most of the material I'll be talking about today. Okay. Um, okay, so first of all, I'd like to just to give a, a brief overview of Thurston's ideas for using geometry to study three manifolds. And I guess the basic idea, if we're given a three-dimensional manifold, we'd like to find some kind of very nice geometric representation of that manifold, try and find a sort of nicer shape. So more precisely, what we'd like to find um, are geometric structures. So these will actually be some sort of Riemannian metrics, which are, first of all, locally homogeneous. So roughly, this means the geometry should look the same locally near each point. Um, more precisely, because okay, so any two points should have isometric neighborhoods. Okay. The other thing we normally want is to have complete metrics on our spaces. So this means, I mean, roughly speaking, you can't sort of fall off the edge of your space after going a finite distance. So you know, more precisely, every Cauchy sequence should converge in the space. And, and this also means that you can extend geodesics infinitely. Okay. So let's see, so if you want to deal with all possible kinds of three manifolds, um, Thurston showed that there's basically eight kinds of geometry that we need. So three of these are very familiar. So there's constant curvature geometries, Euclidean geometry, hyperbolic geometry, and spherical geometry. But there's also five other kind of geometries which are not quite so symmetric, but um, I won't say much about these, but basically they're kind of products of two-dimensional geometries with a real line or sort of twisted versions of these products. Okay. Okay. And I guess of all of these, the most important is hyperbolic geometry, which is the one we've been talking about mostly um, in, in the previous talks. And just a few kind of key properties. So hyperbolic geometry in any dimension has constant negative curvature. And I guess we'll usually normalize how the curvature is minus one. Um, it's a completely symmetric geometry. So it looks the same near every point and in every direction. And in fact, I mean, if you take a, an orthonormal frame, so you have a family of orthonormal vectors at one point, you can take it to any other orthonormal frame. So it has kind of complete symmetry. Now, one key property, okay, one of the big differences to Euclidean geometry is that angle sums in triangles are going to be less than pi. And that's, I mean, that's going to be important. Um, so this is reflecting the fact you have negative curvature. And in fact, you have this famous <coughs> formula. Um, the angle sum is just pi minus the area. Okay. One other kind of general fact about hyperbolic geometry I just want to mention is that you can, you have so-called ideal polygons and ideal polyhedra. So you imagine with some sort of finite compact polyhedron and you let the vertices move out towards infinity. Now I guess something special happens in hyperbolic geometry here that um, in this limiting case, you actually end up with something with finite volume or finite area. So that these are ideal polyhedra. 
And, and those are going to be kind of the building blocks we use for studying hyperbolic structures on three manifolds in, in I'm going to talk about today. Okay. And I guess the other key property, um, things like geodesics diverge exponentially fast. So here's kind of a picture. I think it's um, maybe the same picture that so Young showed the other day. This is a tiling of hyperbolic three space by right angled dodecahedra. So if you look in the middle here, so here's one pentagon. Um, you can see there's 12 sort of pentagonal faces fitting together in the middle. And then if you start so reflecting this, um, we have four pieces fitting together around each edge. So all the angles are actually pi over two, and you get this nice tiling of the whole space by these right angle dodecahedra. Okay. So I guess, yeah, so you can see lots of things that are in this picture. Um, for instance, the number of copies, say, of this dodecahedron within some radius r, it actually grows exponentially fast. So things are growing exponentially fast in hyperbolic geometry. Okay. Okay, so next I just want to remind you of the basic definitions. I guess you've seen all these before. Um, but so things we're going to be concentrating on today are hyperbolic three manifolds. And, and these are spaces that are locally modeled on three-dimensional hyperbolic geometry. So another one, in the language of differential geometry, these are Romanian manifolds of constant curvature minus one. Okay. Now the, nice, the nicest case is where you have a complete metric. In that case, you can think of the universal cover as just H3, hyperbolic space, and you can think of your manifold as H3 divided by some nice discrete group of isometries. Okay, and I guess in the orientable case, um, I think as you've seen already, um, you can think of um, the group of orientation preserving hyperbolic isometries as SL2C. Um, they act as sort of Mobius transformations on the, on say C union the point at infinity, which is the sphere at infinity. And what we've got is basically a discrete torsion-free subgroup of PSLC, and we take the quotient of H3 by that. So that's kind of the algebraic way of describing these, these manifolds. Um, I guess more generally, if you just have a discrete subgroup, okay, that's, that's what we call a Kleinian group, and, and the quotient is going to be generally a, an orbifold, a hyperbolic orbifold. Okay, so they're kind of the basic definitions. And I guess what I'd like to start off today are with some some examples of three-dimensional hyperbolic manifolds. So first example, I guess the idea is very similar to what you've seen for surfaces. So I guess the other day you saw if you start say with a genus two surface, um, you can think of that as an octagon with the sides identified in pairs. Okay, and then if you take, say, if you arrange so that all the um, edges have got the same length, then you can start gluing the edges together by isometries. And if you arrange carefully so that the angles, at, there's just one vertex, if the angles add up to 2 pi, you end up with a hyperbolic structure on that genus 2 surface. Okay. So now you can do the same kind of thing in higher dimensions as well. So basic idea is to start with some kind of hyperbolic polyhedra. You want to try and adjust the geometry of the polyhedra so that they fit together, so you can glue the faces together. But also you need angles adding up to 2 pi around the edges. So, so here's a famous example, a seifert faber dodecahedral space. Um, what we do is start with a dodecahedron. Okay, so you have this polyhedron um, with pentagonal faces, 12 pentagons. And the idea is we glue each face to the opposite face by rotating by sort of three tenths, three tenths of two pi. Okay, so each face gets glued to the opposite face. 
Now, this stage you need to see, check how the edges are identified. So this is a little exercise. But what, what we find in this case, the edges form actually six groups and you have five pieces fitting together around each edge. So the edges are all of order five. Okay, so what we'd like to do um, is find a hyperbolic structure. Well, what we can do is look at sort of regular dodecahedra in hyperbolic space. So if you think about, first of all, imagine a very tiny regular dodecahedra. For instance, we could work in the Poincaré ball model. You can just take the vertices of some regular dodecahedron. If you have a really tiny dodecahedron, the angles are going to be close to um, the Euclidean angles. And I guess you can see, I'm, yeah, so I'm not sure exactly what they are, but you can see they're actually bigger than, say, 72 degrees. And then you imagine expanding this dodecahedron, letting the vertices go out to infinity, so keeping it regular. And I guess in, in the limiting case, where all the vertices go to infinity, um, the angles become 60 degrees. Okay, so you, that's another exercise to check that. So somewhere in between, you can find angles at each, along each edge, exactly 72 degrees. And in, in this case, um, everything will glue together by isometries to give us um, a hyperbolic structure on, on this manifold. Okay, so this is very much like we did um, for the surface of genus two. Okay, so that's a nice example of a closed hyperbolic three manifold. Okay. Yeah, now the other another sort of key example I'd like to talk about, it's a non-compact manifold. It's going to be a non-compact hyperbolic manifold of finite volume. Um, and this is the complement of the figure eight knot. So the idea is we start with this figure eight knot in the three sphere. So you can think of this, the three sphere as R3 together with a single point at infinity. Okay. So now we're going to remove the knot, so we take the complement S3 minus K. And the idea, so this goes back to Thurston's notes, is that we can divide this up into two so-called ideal tetrahedra. So this is going to be compact tetrahedra with the four vertices removed. Okay, so these are sort of um, non-compact objects, ordinary tetrahedra without the vertices. So what I claim is um, you can actually divide the complement of this knot into these two tetrahedra. Um, so here's, so we've got one on the right. It's got faces A, B, C, D. So these are triangles with vertices removed. These are going to be glued to this tetrahedron on the left with faces A prime, B prime, C prime, D prime. And I've also, okay, the edges get, they have two different sorts. So we've got these red edges and we've got the blue edges. So for instance, if we want to glue this face A to the face A primed, you have to do it so that the edges and the arrows match up. So for instance, let's see. So th this face is going to go to this face. This edge, the red edge here, so going down like this, has to match with the red edge here going up. So you can see this goes to this, and then this edge would have to go to this edge, and this edge would go to that one. So just from these kind of identifications on the edges, you can see exactly how all the faces are glued together. So let's see, okay, so this looks a bit, mysterious and I'll just say a couple of words about so how this works but I think to understand this you really need to sit down go home and try and check the details so and you can always look in Thurston's notes um, for some more works I think it's actually good to make yourself a model so you can make sort of a paper model and see how it all works but so here's the basic idea um, so we start off with our knot, and then we're going to add two extra edges. So we've got this blue edge at the bottom, 
and a red edge at the top. So now we've got some kind of graph in the three sphere. Now the idea is to start filling in two cells. So for instance, okay, for face A, you imagine, so you fill in this region here, and then you have a little twist going across to here. And then around here, you come in like this. You see sort of a, go along the edge, you go back. And you can trace out kind of the boundary of a two cell. That's going to be A. So that's one of the faces in this decomposition. Um, similarly for the other thing, so this B, D is in the middle. So you can see kind of a, there's a disc in here with a little twist at the bottom. So B is going around here. C is kind of the outside, including the pointed infinity. Okay. So this is a two complex. And you have, along the edges, you have various two cells coming together. Okay, now the idea is to you imagine cutting the three sphere along this two dimensional complex. And if you think about it, there's going to be, the complement's got two pieces. The sort of one piece above the plane containing this diagram, and there's another piece below. Now you can check both of those are going to be three-dimensional balls. And on the boundary you're going to see some pattern of faces. So if you look closely at what happens on the boundary, okay, you'll see kind of four faces on each, each boundary. Um, but then what we want to do is remove the knot. So the next thing is you remove the edges that are along the knot. Or you can, you can actually Another way to do it is you sort of shrink the edges along the knot to points and then you remove those points. And finally, you actually end up with this decomposition into two ideal tetrahedra. Okay, so I'm going to leave this as an exercise to try and go through the details of this and see how you come up with this, this picture. Okay. But this is a very nice description of the figure eight knot complement. And what we can do is use this to come up with a hyperbolic structure. So we have these two ideal tetrahedra. Let's see, if I go back, let me just go back a bit. You see that along the blue edge, there's six pieces coming together. Okay, so here I've got six edges labeled blue, so there's six pieces fitting together. Along the red edge, again, there's three, there's six pieces coming together. So what we'd like to do is try and make all the angles along the edges 60 degrees. And in fact, okay, so we've got these two groups of six edges. And you can do this um, if you take a regular ideal tetrahedron in hyperbolic space. So the idea is we'll work, say, in the, in the Poincare disk model. You imagine a regular Euclidean tetrahedron with all, so it's maybe centered at the middle of this ball with vertices on the sphere at infinity. And if you do this, it's not hard to check um, that all the dihedral angles, so that's the angles between the faces, they're all 60 degrees exactly. Okay. And I guess we'll come up, we'll see another picture of this a bit later, but. Um, I guess in this picture, each face corresponds to the intersection of a plane bounded by some circle. And I guess by symmetry, you can see um, the circles going through a vertex. They all meet at the same angle, so they all meet at angles of 60 degrees. And that, that gives you the, the dihedral angle. Okay. So now what we can do is take two, two of these, two regular ideal tetrahedra, um, the faces are all ideal hyperbolic triangles. So they're, they're triangles with the three vertices at infinity. It's, it's not hard to check that any two ideal triangles are congruent. You can take one to another by a hyperbolic isometry. So that means you can start gluing the faces of these together in the previous sort of combinatorial pattern by using hyperbolic isometries. Um, the angles along the edge, they're going to add up to give you 6 by 60 degrees, so that's 360 degrees along each edge. 
And in fact, you need to do a bit more checking, but it, it turns out that this gives you a nice complete hyperbolic structure on the figure eight knot complement. And it's going to have finite, finite volume. So this is kind of a basic example for the things I'm going to talk about um, today. Right. Now at this stage I want to just talk briefly about some of the general results about um, existence of these sort of hyperbolic structures and nice geometric structures. And I guess the key result um, I guess well, for a long time this was a geometrization conjecture. Um, this is formulated by Thurston, I guess about well, 30 or a bit over 30 years ago. Um, it gives kind of a beautiful picture of the overall structure of three manifolds. And I guess very recently this has been proved by the work of Perelman, building on um, the work of Hamilton using the Ritchie curvature flow. But so here's kind of a rough statement. Um, let's start off with a compact, let's say, orientable three-manifold. Now, I guess there's a standard kind of classical decomposition. Any manifold has a kind of connected sum decomposition, basically, which involves cutting it along spheres. So a prime manifold is one that can't be decomposed into two simpler pieces by cutting along two spheres. So, so let, let's assume that's true. Um, so any manifold can be decomposed in a unique way into these kind of prime pieces. Then once you've got this, the idea is that, okay, we'd like to have a geometric structure on the whole manifold, but in general you can't quite do that. Um, some t in general what you have to do is cut along um, incompressible tori. So, in general, there's a nice finite collection of disjoints embedded incompressible tori in M. So these are two-dimensional tori whose fundamental groups inject into the fundamental group of the three-manifold. And, and this is the so-called JSJ decomposition. So it was uh, worked out by Jaco Shalen and also Johansson. Okay. So then after you cut along these tori, the result is that each component of the complement has a nice geometric structure modelled on one of the eight geometries that I mentioned before. So basically this is telling you that you can understand all three manifolds by using geometry, geometric structures. So this is a really powerful result with lots of, lots of important consequences. Um, okay. So I just mentioned so one special case of this, which is um, generalised as what we saw for the figure eight knot. So let's think about what happens if you have a knot in the three sphere. So imagine you just draw some projection of the knot in R3, and you think of that as sitting in, in the three sphere with the point at infinity. Okay. So first of all, what we're going to see actually, in most cases the knot is hyperbolic. The complement of the knot has a complete hyperbolic structure, just like for the figure eight knot. But there's a few, few exceptions. And I just, okay, so one special case is the case of a torus knot. So there you start with a sort of standard two dimensional torus. And if you can draw your knot on the surface of that torus, that's a very special kind of knot known as a torus knot. Okay, so I think in, in this picture, this is an example of a trefoil knot. Ooh, okay. okay, so that's and more generally, um, knots on the torus you can describe by giving sort of two integers. The knot will say it'll wind say p times around this direction and q times around the other direction. So you have these kind of pq torus knots um, for relatively prime pairs of integers p and q. Okay, so these are very special you can see that in this case the complement, it doesn't have a hyperbolic structure, but it has another nice kind of geometric structure. Um, you know, so it comes from a sort of ciphered fibred structure on the complement. But, okay, now this is a very special case, the so-called satellite knots. 
That is, you, you start off with some knot. Um, so maybe on the right here, I think this is a figure eight knot. You thicken it up, so you take a, a solid torus around that knot. And then you draw another knot inside the solid torus. Okay, so the idea is you, so you have something like the left, here's a knot inside a solid torus, and you put it inside some neighbourhood of this other knot. So, so this is kind of built up in pieces. Um, this is a so-called satellite knot. In, in this case, there's actually a nice sort of incompressible torus. So the boundary of this solid torus separates this into two pieces, and you, you get some sort of torus decomposition. Okay, so that, that's another case where you can't get a hyperbolic structure. But then, okay, the main result is, so this is work of Thurston, from his result on Harkin um, three manifolds. If you have any knot in the three sphere, the complement always, it has a geometric structure, if and only if it's not a satellite knot. Okay, so if you don't have this kind of, if it's built up in this way from sort of simpler knots, it's not geometric. On the other hand, most of the time you get a hyperbolic structure and that occurs if and only if it's not a satellite knot or a torus knot. So this, this result, it's telling you that most knot complements are hyperbolic. The exceptions are very special. And I guess it's very striking if you look in the so knot tables. I think if you go up to, let's see, yeah, no, I've forgotten exactly, but if you go up to say, 12 crossings, there's only maybe about uh, maybe 10 or so that are not hyperbolic. So as many, um, the vast majority of knots are hyperbolic. And I guess there's also a version of this for link complements where you take a disjoint union of um, sort of knots in the three sphere. Again, most of the time the result's hyperbolic. Okay, so this is showing that hyperbolic geometry is very important for studying these sorts of manifolds. Now, in fact, there's also a way to see that um, many closed hyperbolic manifolds are also hyperbolic. Many closed manifolds are hyperbolic. Um, and what we can do is this process of Dane filling that allows us to go from something like a knot complement to a closed manifold. So let's see. So in general, if we start off with a, a hyperbolic manifold of finite volume, but non-compact, then from the Margulis lemma, which I guess you've heard about already, um, the ends of this manifold, they're very special. They look like, they're sort of cusps where, which look like a product of a torus cross um, an interval. So you have these kind of torus cross sections which shrink down exponentially fast as you go out towards um, infinity. Okay, so if we start off with a manifold like this, it's always homeomorphic to the interior of some compact three manifold with boundary consisting of tori. Okay, so these, I'm going to talk a lot about these today, so I'll call these cusp hyperbolic manifolds. So, okay, a key example of this is a figure eight knot complement that we talked about already. Um, so, that's one good example, but just about most hyperbolic knot complements are going to be these sort of cusp hyperbolic manifolds. Okay, so how do we get close manifolds from these? The idea is to, okay, we start off with your knot. So here's the figure eight knot again. You remove um, a little tube around the knot. So you remove a sort of tor a solid torus centered on the knot. So that, that gives us something with a torus boundary. So we've got a compact manifold with boundary. The idea is we want to get rid of that boundary. So how do we do it? We take a solid torus and we glue the boundary of the solid torus to the boundary of this knot complement. Um, in that way, we'll end up with a closed, closed manifold. Now, I guess 
Turns out there's lots of different ways to do this. Um, this might be surprising if you haven't seen it before, but you can parameterize these by specifying which curve in, say, the boundary of this knot complement bounds a disk in the solid torus. So here I've got this meridian curve which bounds a disk over here. And it could give you any simple closed curve on this boundary torus. So for instance, it might give you this curve that I've shown in this picture. So there's actually lots of choices here. Um, basically, you can specify, say, a PQ curve which winds, say, P times around the meridian direction and Q times around this other direction, which is the longitude direction. So if you take any pair of integers P and Q, that gives, you can attach solid torus, so this PQ curve gets killed, it bounds a disk when you do the Dan filling. So there's, there's many choices here. And so another famous result of Thurston says that in most cases, if we start with a cusp hyperbolic manifold, the result is a closed hyperbolic manifold. So, okay. So roughly speaking, so almost all manifolds obtained from M by day and filling are going to be hyperbolic if we start with a cusped hyperbolic three manifold. So more precisely, there's going to be a finite number of exceptions. There's a finite number of curves you have to exclude for each of the boundary components. Okay. Now, so if you put these kind of results together, it shows in some sense that most closed hyperbolic manifolds are hyperbolic. So from sort of standard topology results, I guess going back to, um, let's see, uh, <coughs> so licorice for instance, every three manifold can be obtained by Dane filling from some hyperbolic link complement. So yeah, so this is very, this Dane, hyperbolic Dane filling, it's a very general process um, for constructing three manifolds. If you take a top closed three manifold, you can find a link in the three sphere so that um, the manifold's obtained by Dane filling on the link. And in fact, you can refine this a bit to get Dane filling on some hyperbolic link complements. So we know most links complements are hyperbolic and most ways of doing day and filling are hyperbolic. So in some sense, this is telling us that most three manifolds are actually hyperbolic. Okay, so this is one reason why, I mean, studying hyperbolic manifolds is so important. It's really the sort of main class of three manifolds in some sense. Okay. And I guess, yeah, at this stage, I mean, one, this is a very vague statement. Um, I mean, a, a nice open problem here is to try and make this more precise. So can you put some kind of, well, some measure on the three manifold so you can really see that most of them are hyperbolic. So that's, that's a good open problem, I think. All right, so that's kind of the introduction for today. Um, what I'd like to do in the remaining part of this talk is talk about how we can actually compute and understand the sort of geometry of these hyperbolic structures. Okay, so we know from these general results, most manifolds are hyperbolic. But that doesn't necessarily tell you anything about what the geometry looks like or how it's related to the things like the topology of the manifold. So th these are the sorts of problems I'd like to talk about in my talks. Okay. So what I want to do, first of all, is talk about a very important method for actually computing these hyperbolic structures. And it extends what we did for the figure eight mode complement. So this method was introduced by Thurston back in his notes. And it's also been implemented very nicely um, in the computer program Snappy, which was um, written by Jeff Weeks. So I think and at this stage, this is you know, definitely the most useful general method for actually computing hyperbolic structures and, and understanding the detailed properties for examples. Okay. 
So we're going to start off with a cusped manifold. So we have a topological manifold, which is the interior of a compact manifold, with boundary consisting of tori. Okay, so imagine you know, something like a knot complement or a link complement is a good example of this. So the first step is to decompose the manifold topologically into a collection, finite number of ideal tetrahedra with the faces glued together in pairs. So remember, an ideal tetrahedron here is just a compact tetrahedron with the four vertices removed. And what we want to do is exactly the same sort of thing we did for the figure eight knot. Decompose it. So we take these ideal tetrahedra, glue the faces together in pairs. So that gives you a nice kind of topological ideal triangulation for the manifold. So the next step, okay, we actually want to find geometry. So the idea is to find shapes of ideal tetrahedra in hyperbolic space which fit together nicely. So as in, sort of just as for the figure eight knot example. So, okay, so what conditions do we need? Well, first of all, there's kind of an obvious condition. Around each edge, where the tetrahedra fit together, the angle should add up to two pi. So you want to see a nice um, neighborhood which looks like a piece of hyperbolic space. Okay, so this is an obvious condition you get. Now, because we're using ideal tetrahedra, all the vertices are actually at an infinity. So the edges are actually infinitely long. And, and this causes kind of an extra complication because so when, when you glue things together around an infinitely long edge, um, you might get some kind of translation along the edge as you go walk around the edge. So there could be some kind of translational holonomy as you go around the edge. And, and that would be bad. That would give some kind of shearing type singularities um, across the edge. So there's an extra condition here we need, no translation or holonomy along the edge. Um, okay, one way to think about this, if you think about two dimensional cross sections perpendicular to the edge, you'll see sort of little wedges in the hyperbolic plane. They should fit together to give you a hyperbolic disk. Um, what could go wrong is you start with a little wedge, so in one sort of plane, you keep going around this edge, you can extend it. You go into the next tetrahedron, you try and extend this plane. Eventually, once you've gone all the way around the edge, you might come up at a, back at a different height and that would give you some sort of translation. So that kind of thing's bad. So this is kind of one complication. It doesn't come up if you have finite edges. Now, okay, just as in the figure eight, we can always glue the edges together by isometries, the faces together by isometries, because the faces are all ideal triangles, and any two ideal triangles in hyperbolic space are congruent. So, Okay, so you can always start doing this gluing. And whatever you do, for any shapes for these ideal tetrahedra, you'll get a hyperbolic structure on the complement of the one skeleton. In other words, M minus all the edges, you always get some hyperbolic structure. But now, to get a nice structure along the edge, you need to satisfy these edge conditions. And if you do that, then you do get a hyperbolic structure on the whole of M. But there's another sort of complication here. Because we've got a non-compact manifold, you might end up with an incomplete hyperbolic structure in general. And I guess, yeah, I mean, this is not so clear, but it, again, probably a good place to look for this is Thurston's notes or his book, actually, for more on this possibility of incompleteness. So to get completeness, we actually need extra conditions. The idea is that, okay, each, near each cusp, you have a two-dimensional torus as a cross-section. And it turns out what you'd like is to get a, a cross-section which is actually a Euclidean surface made up of horospheres or horospherical triangles. 
So let's see, I'm not sure if anyone talked about horospheres, but these are basically the sort of spheres of infinite radius in hyperbolic space. You imagine, say, spheres of radius R going through some fixed point. If you let the radius increase, you get a kind of a limiting object, which is a horosphere. It actually has intrinsic Euclidean geometry, but it's actually curved. It has some curvature plus one in all directions. So, but these horospheres are very nice. They have Euclidean geometry. And if you can fit them together by around, so near each of the cusps, um, the whole manifold will be complete. So once you've got one of these Euclidean surfaces, as you move out a finite distance d, you'll see another copy of the Euclidean torus. Um, the metric gets multiplied by some factor e to the minus d, and you get this sort of geometry cusps shrinking down exponentially fast as you go out further and further. So, okay, so you have this, these are the conditions you need to find a hyperbolic structure by gluing together um, ideal tetrahedra. Okay, so the question is at this stage, so how can you actually check these conditions? So we'd like a way of parameterizing the ideal tetrahedra and checking these edge conditions and the completeness conditions. So it turns out there's a very nice way to do this. So if we go back to upper half space model for hyperbolic space, you have a kind of a nice sphere at infinity. So in this picture, so imagine everything above this plane is hyperbolic space. The, the sphere, the, the plane at the bottom here is actually at infinity. It's at infinite distance from all the points. And if you take that together with a point at infinity, so imagine that's right up the top here, um, that gives you a sphere. So you get, think of this as complex plane union infinity. Now, by using the structure of the hyperbolic isometry group, so it's this PSL2C, each of the isometries is represented by a Mobius transformation on this sphere at infinity. Um, if we have an ideal tetrahedron, we have four vertices at infinity, and you can actually move them to a standard sort of position. So you can move, say, three of the vertices to zero, one, and infinity. And the fourth one is going to move to some point Z in the complex plane. So you can actually normalize the position by an isometry, so it looks like this. We've got so zero, one, Z, and infinity is way up the top. So, okay, so they're the vertices of this ideal tetrahedron. Um, the faces are made up of sort of vertical planes. There's one sort of over this edge, one over this, one over this edge. And there's also a plane at the bottom, which I haven't drawn here, which looks like um, part of a hemisphere going through these three points. Um, okay. So here, so we can normalize things. And we get a single parameter, a complex parameter Z. So it's a complex number not equal to zero or one describing the shape of this tetrahedron. Now, I guess you should really think of this um, parameter as associated with this particular edge going from zero to infinity. If you do the same kind of thing for the other edges, you get sort of three related complex numbers. So um, z minus one over z and one over one minus z. And I guess if you look at the edges of your tetrahedron, they occur in this kind of pattern. So you've got so z, z prime, z double prime around each vertex. Um, opposite edges get the same parameter. And one other thing worth noticing here, if you multiply these three numbers together, okay, you always get minus one. So you've got kind of three edge parameters associated with each ideal tetrahedron. Um, everything, you could describe everything in just terms of the single parameter Z, um, but sometimes it's more useful to think of a parameter for each of the edges in this way. Okay. So now I want to think about these conditions for gluing these together. And first condition with the edge conditions want things to fit together nicely around each um, edge of the triangulation. 
So if you think about little um, triangles, well, yeah, little cross sections made up of horospheres perpendicular to the edge, what you'll see, so this is kind of developing the um, triangulation into the hyperbolic space. And we can drag, um, develop these little cross sections into Euclidean triangles. So the first cross section or the first tetrahedron will be some triangle with some parameter, let's say I've called it Z of E1. That corresponds to some edge of some tetrahedron. Then there'll be another complex parameter from the next, coming from the next tetrahedron, another one for the next um, thing fitting together. And what we want is some sort of picture like this. These triangles should fit together nicely so that they close up and the total angle around the middle should be exactly 2 pi. So maybe let me just draw a few pictures. Um, sorts of things that may go wrong. So we might start off, okay, so here we start here, take a triangle, another triangle. So in general, we might come back with something like this. So as you walk around this edge, um, the thing may not close up. You might come back at some different distance from the origin. So this would be bad. Um, in that case, the product of these, okay. In the good case, the product of these complex parameters is exactly equal to one. So you can think of sort of going from this sort of vector from the center to here, you multiply it by this complex number to get the next vector multiply it by the next complex number to get this vector, keep multiplying, and the final vector is going to be this product times the original vector. So here, this is an example, this is a bad case. The edge condition fails in this, in this picture. I guess the other thing that could happen, even if um, this product is equal to one, you might get some sort of um, branching so you can imagine, I want, let's see, so imagine you go around, you might wrap around several times and you get some kind of big angle. So you might go around, here the angle might be bigger than 2 pi for instance. You might wrap around 2 or 3 or some other number of times. And, and that's also bad because um, we want the total angle which is the sum of these, you can think of it as the sum of the arguments to be exactly equal to 2 pi. Okay, so there are the edge conditions. So let's go back now to our example of the figure 8 knot complement. So I've redrawn the picture of the identifications here. Um, so you have to match the red edges to the red edges here. Um, the pattern's the same as we had before. So to parameterize these, so I pick some edge here and I'm going to call the complex parameter Z. Similarly for the second tetrahedron, I'll pick some edge and call this complex parameter W. And the others are related in this way. Okay, so these are things like um, Z minus 1 over Z and 1 over 1 minus Z. Now it's very easy to write down the edge equations. Um, so for instance, if we look at the blue edge, we have six things fitting together. And this condition just says that the, the six edge parameters around um, the blue edge multiply to give you one. So let's see, so what have we got? If we look on the right here, we've got a Z from this edge, got another Z from this edge, a Z prime. Um, if we look in the left tetrahedra, there's a W, W prime, and a W. So the product of those six things has to be equal to one. So you can just write it down from this diagram. Okay. Similarly for the red edge, okay, what have we got? If we look at the red edge, you see there's a Z prime, a Z double prime, Z double prime. On the left-hand side, you've got a double prime, a W, W double prime, W double prime. So the product of those things has to be equal to 1. And you can rewrite this just in terms of, say, the Z and the W, and the first equation looks like this. So it's a simple polynomial equation. 
z times w times 1 minus z, 1 minus w is equal to 1. Okay. The second equation, after you simplify it a bit, turns out to look like this. So in fact, um, you're just getting the inverses of the things in this previous equation. <coughs> so in fact, um, we actually get so two equations, but they're actually completely equivalent. So the first equation is equivalent to the second. So you really could forget about the second equation. And, and this is something that's always going to happen. If you've got a cusp manifold, you get some relations. You get a relation between the equations, one relation for each cusp. So what have we got? We've got two complex parameters, z and w. We've got one polynomial equation. So from that you can see there's going to be a one complex dimensional set of solutions. So we get a one dimensional solution space. And each of these is going to give some kind of hyperbolic structure. But in general, they're possibly incomplete. And I guess, yeah, if you think about Mosto rigidity or Mosto Prasad rigidity, we expect a unique, complete hyperbolic structure. Um, so that would just give you a single point or some sort of zero dimensional solution space. So it's just as well, um, these other ones are not, well, these other ones are going to be incomplete. Okay. So let's see. So if we actually want a complete structure, we need to find this kind of nice cross section to the cusp. We want a kind of Euclidean torus made up of um, horospherical triangles. So let's see. So how can we look at this out? Well, I've kind of redrawn the tetrahedra here. The idea is first we cut off the corners of the tetrahedron. So you cut off a little piece near each um, vertex and what you get left with is a little triangle. Okay, so now we've got some sort of compact object. It's a tetrahedron with all the corners removed. Now if you look at these little triangles, they fit together to give you a nice triangulation of the torus. And you can figure out exactly what this looks like by using the gluings um, for our tetrahedra. So I'm not sure. So for instance, you know, this, here's a little triangle. The face here is glued somehow over to this face. You can figure out exactly where this edge should go and it's going to glue to one of these other triangles. I don't know, maybe this one. So that tells you this triangle gets glued to the next triangle. You can continue working out how they fit together and you get some sort of picture like this. Um, I think it's a bit hard to see, but the triangles here, they, they fit together and this gives you some sort of triangulation of the torus. So th this picture is really um, so the universal cover of this two-dimensional torus. Now, what we can do is look at the kind of developing map for a cusp cross-section. So we're mapping it into a horosphere at some, um, in upper half space, it's mapping to some plane at some fixed height. And that has a Euclidean structure. So for each of these little triangles, we know the geometry of the triangle from these um, complex parameters. So each of these complex parameters tells you kind of the shape of Euclidean triangle up to similarity, up to rescaling. So given the shapes for Z and W, you can start drawing this picture. Um, now I've drawn a kind of nice version of a picture here, but let's see. Do we have a pen? <laughs> but in general, okay, this could look so you start off, you take the first triangle, you take the next triangle, and you, you start drawing some kind of picture. <coughs> and if you go from some kind of initial copy of an edge, oh, so you might go around a few things here, you end up at some other copy. Um, there's going to be some holonomy. 
So if you go around this kind of some loop gamma on the thing, to get from this edge to this edge, you take, you multiply it by some sort of complex number. So some sort of complex multiplication factor going from here to here. And what we'd like is actually to end up with a Euclidean torus. Um, so to get from this edge, this edge and this edge should be parallel. In this case, we want the holonomy to be exactly equal to one. So you just multiply by one to get from that to this. Similarly, you want the holonomy in this direction to be one to make these edges parallel. So this is kind of the Euclidean picture. Structure <coughs> on the torus. In general, you get this kind of picture, which is kind of similarity structure. Okay, so we want this kind of special case. So if you go through this procedure, you can actually figure out, so for instance, to go from here to here, you get a multiplication factor, which is some product of these complex edge parameters maybe with a plus or minus one sign. Similarly, to go from, say, so here to here, um, you multiply by some complex parameter, which is, again, a product of these edge parameters. And if you work it out carefully, we find, so if we take um, the standard sort of longitude and meridian on the torus, so the meridian's a little curve which goes once around um, the knot. So it's a boundary of a disk meeting the knot in one point. The longitude sort of follows around the knot and closes up. So in this case, we get some simple expressions like this. Um, Z squared times 1 minus Z all squared for the longitude direction. I guess that's this direction in the picture. The meridian, we get something like that. So notice again, um, these are giving us, they're all just, um, just about polynomial functions of the parameters. Now for the complete case, what we want is kind of this some parallelogram as a fundamental domain for our torus. We want something like this. What that means is that these holonomies, say in reading a longitude direction should be equal to one. And, and that gives us sort of some extra equations. So we had a, a previous equations, I think, which we just disappeared back here. So we have this equation together with these completeness conditions. And here it's an easy exercise you can check. We now get a unique solution um, with, at least with the imaginary parts of Z and W greater than zero. This conditions mean tetrahedra are sort of positively oriented. They don't turn inside out. And in fact, the solution is z equals w is equal to e to the pi i over three. And that corresponds exactly to two regular ideal tetrahedra. Okay, so this recovers kind of the previous description of the hyperbolic structure we had before, um, but from this kind of general method. All right. Just, yeah, so notice we're expecting some kind of unique solution because of Mosto facade rigidity. We expect a unique complete hyperbolic structure. Okay. So this is a sort of completely general method that you can use to understand um, hyperbolic structures on cuffs manifolds. The other thing you can also use it to do is understand this hyperbolic gain filling. Now, I won't say much about this, but Thurston showed that many of these incomplete structures that we got, so we had this one complex dimensional space of solutions to the gluing equations. Many of them actually have topological significance, and by taking completions, you get hyperbolic structures on manifolds obtained by day and filling. So using this method, you can also work um, with hyperbolic structures on closed manifolds. 
And just very briefly, so how does this work? Well, if we have a PQ down filling, that means it's a P times meridian plus Q times the longitude bound to disk when you attach the solid torus. So we need to satisfy the same sort of edge conditions as before. But we also want um, the PQ curve should bound a disk when we add the solid torus. And that gives us an extra condition. When we go around the PQ curve, we should see basically a rotation by 2 pi. Um, so that will guarantee that the PQ curve actually bounds a disk with an angle of 2 pi in the middle. And that translates into a sort of holonomy condition like this. Um, the holonomy of the meridian to the P times holonomy of the longitude to the Q should be equal to 1. And, and that's going to be another sort of polynomial equation in the complex edge parameters. So you can also use this very successfully to find um, hyperbolic structures for closed manifolds by Dan filling. All right. So I think in, in the remaining of the, of the talk today, I'd like to talk about some very nice computer programs which we'll, you, we can use to compute hyperbolic structures and study um, their properties. So the first program I want to talk about, and this is program Snappy, developed by Jeff Weeks.